Welcome to The Explainer. Today, we're diving into the brand new Endocrine Society Guideline on Primary Aldosteronism. We're going to take this dense document and turn it into a practical clinical playbook, something you can actually use to find and treat a condition that is way more common and way more dangerous than we ever thought. So here's the game plan. We'll start by looking at just how big this problem really is, this hidden epidemic of PA. Then we'll unpack the 2025 guideline itself, zeroing in on the stuff that's really going to change your practice, who you should screen, what to do when that screen comes back positive, and, this is a big one, the new goals for medical therapy that go way beyond just controlling blood pressure. All right, first things first, we have to understand the scale of what we're dealing with. You know, for decades, we were all taught that primary aldosteronism was a zebra, a rare exotic diagnosis. Well, the new guideline makes it crystal clear it's not a zebra, it's a horse. In fact, it's one of the most common causes of hypertension we've been missing all along. I mean, just look at these numbers from the guideline. They're pretty staggering. We're not talking about a fringe condition here. This data suggests PA could be driving hypertension in, what, maybe one out of every seven of our patients in primary care? And for those with resistant hypertension, it could be closer to one in three. This isn't a rare disease anymore. This is fundamental to how we need to think about hypertension. And if we miss it, the stakes are incredibly high. Aldosterone excess is just plain toxic to the cardiovascular system. A meta-analysis that's cited in the guidelines shows that for the exact same blood pressure, a patient with PA has over two and a half times the odds of having a stroke. Not to mention way higher rates of coronary artery disease, AFib, and heart failure. This is serious. So this slide right here, this is probably the biggest mental hurdle we all need to get over. That classic textbook patient, you know, the one with hypertension and hypokalemia, that's the exception. That is not the rule. The data is clear. Most patients with PA have a totally normal potassium. So if you're waiting for that potassium to drop before you even think about screening, you are going to miss almost all of them. So if these patients are everywhere, how do we find them? Well, that brings us to our new clinical playbook. This guideline was built for busy clinicians like us. The whole point is to take PA out of the world of academic debates and put it right on our everyday clinical radar. And let's be clear. The goal here isn't to pile on more work, it's actually the opposite. It's to create a streamlined, evidence-based path so we can get the right patients on a targeted therapy, one that actually dials back the specific cardiovascular and kidney risks that come from having too much aldosterone. So the goals really boil down to this. Find more of these patients, treat them specifically with either medical therapy or surgery, cut down on strokes and heart attacks, and, you know, point out where we still need to do more research. It's a roadmap for today's clinic and tomorrow's research. Okay, let's talk about the first play in this new playbook. And honestly, this might be the most disruptive one. Recommendation one is a total rethink of who we should even be screening for PA in the first play. And there it is. The guideline now suggests screening all individuals with hypertension. Let that sink in for a second. This is a massive shift away from just screening a few high-risk groups. Now, it's a conditional recommendation. They know there are real-world resource issues, but the message is loud and clear. We should be moving towards universal screening. And the screening test itself? It's just a simple blood draw. The key is the aldosterone to renin ratio, the ARR, which you get from a morning sample while the patient is seated. And it's really important you also check their potassium. Not because it's part of the ratio, but because it's a critical piece of the puzzle for interpreting the results since potassium can mess with aldosterone levels. Now, this is one of the most practical, most useful parts of the whole guideline. It tackles that real-world headache of interfering medications. For the first time, we have clear no-withdrawal and minimal withdrawal strategies. This makes screening possible for so many of our patients on a bunch of different meds. It's a real game-changer. Okay. So you did it. The screen came back positive. You've got a patient who likely has PA. So what's next? Let's walk through the guidelines decision path. So now what? The entire workup from here, which is laid out beautifully in figure two of the guideline, it really all hangs on one crucial conversation with your patient. Everything depends on whether they are a candidate for and actually want to pursue surgery, which is the only potential cure. This shows the guidelines really smart probabilistic approach. You can actually triage patients based on their initial labs into low, intermediate, or high probability of having a surgically fixable or lateralizing cause. 
For a lot of folks in that low probability group, you can skip the big workup and just move right to starting MRA therapy. It's much more efficient. Now for any patient who is even considering surgery, the guideline is really firm on this. A CT scan by itself is not good enough. If you rely only on imaging, you could get the diagnosis wrong or do an unnecessary surgery in almost 40% of cases. Adrenal venous sampling, or AVS, is still the absolute gold standard to prove the aldosterone is coming from just one side before you send someone to the OR. So when you refer a patient for AVS, this is the number you're looking for on the report, the lateralization index, or LI. It's simply the ratio of aldosterone, corrected for cortisol, from the high side versus the low side. A classic LI of 4 or higher confirms that the problem is unilateral and gives you the green light for surgery. Okay, so what about everybody else? The majority of patients will have bilateral disease or they just aren't candidates for surgery. They're going to be managed medically, and the new guideline completely refines our treatment goals for them too. For medical therapy, yep, spironolactone is still a first-line choice. It's cheap, it works but the guideline really highlights that its anti-androgen side effects are a real problem for a lot of people. So the choice between Spiro and a more selective but more expensive agent like Eplernone really has to be a shared decision. It's all about balancing cost versus what that individual patient can tolerate. Okay, this right here is another huge paradigm shift. For years, we've just been titrating MRAs to a blood pressure target. The guideline now says that's not enough. The real biochemical goal is to prove you've adequately blocked the mineralocorticoid receptor. And the biomarker for that? It's a rise in plasma renin, showing you've finally broken that cycle of renin suppression. The protocol for titration, adapted from figure 3, is super clear. You start low, you monitor their BP, potassium, and kidney function. And if their blood pressure is still high and their renin is still suppressed, you up the dose. The key is, you're not just chasing a blood pressure number anymore. You're titrating that MRA to a physiological endpoint, freeing renin from its suppressed state. So let's bring it all home. Let's distill this entire massive guideline down to the absolute most critical practice-changing takeaways. These are the four big shifts. It really boils down to this. Screen way more broadly. Use the ARR and renin level to guide a smarter, more efficient workup. Before any surgery, insist on an AVS to prove it's one-sided. And when you're using MRAs, titrate to both blood pressure and a renin response. This is the new standard of care. So we'll end with this question. We've known for a long time that PA is massively underdiagnosed, leaving our patients exposed to all this extra risk. But now, with this practical playbook in hand, you have the tools to change that. This isn't just about managing blood pressure anymore. It's about uncovering a hidden epidemic and completely changing the health trajectory of your patients.